It seems like we're all involved in too many things. That would be my summary of today's presentation. Uh, one category of things that I have been very involved with is obviously publishing in the jazz field. Um, and uh, to date, mine, I've either been an author or a co-author of seven books. Two are about Lester Young. A lot of people don't remember those. Two are about jazz history. One is the Jazz Century of Change that you read in the uh, historiography course. The other is a jazz history textbook. Uh, two are about Coltrane, and one of them you may not know, so I'm going to show it to you in a minute. No, I should say the other three are about train. Uh, one is my book on train, which most people do know, uh, which is a biography and music analysis. And that's even come out in, a, uh, in French and in Italian. Uh, well, wait, let's do the one that's first. First is going to be, um, yeah, you know what, let's do that first. That's fine. I'll get to it. And then we'll do CDs. And, um, <clears throat> but, uh, and I've also done many, many articles over the years. I don't know how many, 30 or 40, something like that. Uh, I'm not as active writing uh, words anymore, and that's just because I'm so busy making music, which is kind of the way I planned it. You know, in the academic world, you, there's a point where they expect you to write a lot, and then once, you, uh, once you've written a lot, you, you, I mean, ideally you say what you want to say, which is what I did. I didn't write anything because they made me do it, you know. In fact, I started writing before I ever intended to be an academic. I was just one, had stuff I wanted to say, and I started writing. And it was T.J. Anderson, my mentor, the African-American composer, who saw me writing, because I was teaching at Tufts, and he was the chair, and he said, you should think about becoming a full-time academic. So that's why, to this day, I call him my mentor. But <laughs> despite all that, somehow I still managed to come up with stuff once in a while. So, but what I'm doing now is more uh, editing-type projects. So for example, this is my most recent Coltrane thing. Since uh, some of you have been off the scene for a while or have graduated, you may not know this. This is the, uh, right now this is kind of the everything you want to know but we're afraid to ask. I mean, look at the size of this thing. It's everything that's known about every live performance Coltrane ever gave and every recording he ever did. When you talk about the discography, it's 400 pages yeah, of this exactly. book. Well, there's this no point in duplicating that. <laughs> 400 pages of this discography. This came out two years ago. I'm going to pass it around. It's, this is like the, the big, you know, magnum opus of Coltrane research. And what I did is I'm the general editor. I assembled a team of four other people that I know were doing good research on train. And so that's what this is. When I said there were three train books in all, one of them was just a discography, which I was an editor of years ago. And this by far supersedes that. So you don't need to know about that. If you're interested in reference work on train, this is the big one. Uh, the other thing is that I didn't want to do any more books, but my f Dave Lieben is actu an actual personal friend of mine as opposed to a lot of people that I may know just professionally. And uh, he really, really insisted that I should uh, work with him on his autobiography. And finally I agreed to do it. So we've done it as an interview book. And in fact, a, li a little bit later I'm going to play for you uh, uh, one of the interviews that we did, which turned into that book. And that book is, is done now. It's actually coming out probably in February. It's scheduled to come out uh, January, February. It looks to me it'll be more on the later side, so mid-February, something like that. Uh, I think it actually came out very well. He's got an interesting story. He's funny. He's got a lot to say. He talks about his childhood experiences with polio, which a lot of people don't know about. They see him limp and they think, oh, maybe he, he tripped and hurt his leg, but he's got a lifetime, lifelong struggle with that. And um, talks obviously about his experiences with Alvin Jones and Miles Davis. It's, I think it came out very well. And it's all done in interview format. And finally, I can't remember if John mentioned Jazz Perspectives. Jazz Perspectives not. is the journal that I uh, founded. Actually, R Routledge, which is a publisher, asked me if I wanted to start a journal. I don't know when it was, some years ago. Uh, it was in uh, 2006, I guess. And I said no. And uh, I actually want to mention one of our other graduates here, which is Evan Spring. Evan is an excellent editor, and he's an editor of the Online Annual Review, one of the editors, uh, now the Journal of Jazz sure. Studies. And I said uh, to, uh, I talked it over with Evan, I said, maybe you want to do something like this. And we talked to the people at Routledge, and they said, no, we're not just looking for, looking for someone who wants to be an editor, we're looking for a distinguished scholar in the field such as yourself. Not that I'm distinguished or a scholar, but somehow they got this. They got that impression, you know. Maybe I made a few jokes that they thought they were good, good jokes. But in any case, um, 
uh, I talked it out with Evan, and Evan is the one who convinced me. He said, you know, your lifelong mission as a scholar, as a player, you're a player, okay, fine, but as a scholar, your mission has been to raise the level of work in the jazz field. That's why you started this program. That's why you're training musicians as opposed to programs that train uh, somebody to be a journalist. That's why you're training musicians to do this kind of work. That's why you wrote the books you wrote. And he said, the only thing missing is there's no journal, really, for people who want to do some kind of peer-reviewed, whatever type publication. Now, at the time he said that the uh, Journal, uh, your journal hadn't gone online yet. It was coming out on a very regular basis. So, in any case, not to get into the, the pros and cons, there were other places to publish. <laughs> there were other places to publish, but there wasn't this kind of very organized peer-reviewed journal. And he talked me into doing it, but it was so much work. I, I knew I didn't want to do it by myself. I asked John to co-edit. And so, when I passed this around, you notice the first issue is co-edited with John Hallen. Then I left them all by himself, and he edited the last couple of years on his own. And now we've got it set up as an ongoing journal. It's got a long waiting list of people to get in. It's got a tremendous publication record, a great reputation. I know that it's fine. I don't have to worry about it. And now it's just got the usual thing where there's a new editor every three years. And I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to stay around. I think it's been very successful. So here's the, you'll see here the first issue set on about 2007. And you'll see an intro by myself and John. And then the uh, most recent issue you'll see as well as these go around. So um, that's something I was happy to get started, and now I don't need to worry about it anymore. Um, but you may be happy to know, and you've experienced in classes, that I'm still doing research. Every day I do research, and I'm constantly bringing in the research that I'm doing. And so many times I present things to my grad students, they go, How can you be? You know, they, they go, this is mind-blowing or whatever. How can you be doing all this research and not publishing any of it? And uh, one, uh, besides the fact that I'm interested, you know, I'm doing a lot of other things, one reason I didn't publish is a lot of my research is like things that would take about two pages to write up, or maybe three pages. What are you going to do with all these little things? And someone said, oh, make a great book of little observations. I said, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> Finally, I decided this is not the error of the book. This is the error of the web. And the perfect thing is for those to be, for that to be a, an occasional uh, blog. So uh, actually, coincidentally, because I have graduate students who uh, uh, are interns at BGO, one of our BGO interns, Alex Rodriguez, said, have you ever thought of doing a blog for WBGO? Duh. Jazz Times was also interested, and that was a little bit sticky because they've been very good to me over the years, and they put me on their lifetime free subscription and all this. But I decided BGO was a better venue for me f to be putting that up, and I do have a relationship with them there. And so um, I put up five or six, and that is available on BGO. Is there any way we can look at the web right now? On this computer, can I access it? If I want to show them, can I show them the internet on here? Or would that be? Uh, if so, can I just go to Firefox here? Yeah. Okay. And I'll just show you real quick. I'm just going to do, um, let's say, I'll go on this one. And I'll just do, actually, I'll Google. I might go right to the page first. I'll do WBGO um, Porter Blog, something like that. I'll bet you we'll get you there. They call it the title. I didn't think of this. It's called You Don't Know Jazz, as, a, as in You Don't Know Jack. You get it? Ha ha ha. And that's one I did. Uh, all new information about Louis Armstrong, never published before. Even our friend Ricky Riccardi said there was stuff there he didn't know. I've got a blues recording from the Congo, which is the one that usually blows everybody's mind. And that's, that's this one here. And uh, if you haven't uh, checked it out, and the way it works is not only do you have the text, there, but you've got, there you can listen to the recordings. It's the blues in the Congo, but it's 1906. Pretty interesting. I can't close this window now for some reason. Why does that not close? He likes the music too much. <laughs> Mark, that won't close. I don't know why not. Oh, you know what? I'll just pause it for now. I'll pause it. Oh, it won't pause. It's not responding. It froze somehow. It looks like it froze. See, if I click on pause, nothing happens. I don't know why. Not. Yeah, just this window here that's front and center. Oh, good. <laughs> that's, that's true. You can do it that way. Thanks. 
And then uh, the other thing is I have a discussion. So in addition to the text, this, oh no, that's the same. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh no, no, this is it, yeah. And then I talk for a minute. Sorry. Somewhere in here I talk, I don't know. You can hear the blues in there. They're bending that note, that's the blue note. Uh, there's actually a lecture, it's more than that, but there's like a three minute lecture on here somewhere, uh, probably down here. And uh, so the idea it is, it is a multimedia experience, and that's partly why I went with them, because Jazz Times really wanted just text. And I said, you know, that's what I'm trying to get away African from. African American musicians, and even uh, many white that's part musicians of the lecture. and commentators, have felt since early on that jazz has an African connection. So that's uh, one of the things I'm doing, and that's probably more like the way I'm going to be publishing for the uh, near future.